All right, welcome to the 15th call, I believe this is, um, of the Wharf project just overall. Uh, going to be going over some updates again today, uh, talking about some new stuff that's come out uh, that I don't think we've talked about before, and then some potential changes that have come up. Um, hopefully nothing too impactful. Um, but I guess just to kick things off and kind of update as to where things have gone since the last week, uh, we've been doing a lot of internals work. Um, you can, uh, on the screen right now, you can see we've updated EOS IO core. Um, we're kind of prepping that library for the move into the Wharf Kit organization. Um, plan right now is to rename it so it is the Wharf Kit uh, Antelope library. It'll be available to use standalone, just like it is today. Uh, it'll be a little bit more fitting in the WarfKit universe um, and describe effectively the chain that it's interacting with and set the stage if in the future we ever want to add additional protocols. Um, I know EVM is one of those up and growing things, but if in the future we ever decided that WarfKit itself needed EVM compatibility as well, um, then we could add that alongside the Antelope library and Wharf could have kind of both and you'd be able to choose or use both. Um, really not much research has been done there and it is uh, more just like a grand idea right now, but um, going all the way back, this is just kind of why we're going to rename it and place it in there. It's, it's going to be the core library for interacting with Antelope-based chains. Um, from both JavaScript and the Wharf perspective. Um, signing requests will be moving into the Antelope space as well at some point. Uh, we'll have to rename it from ESR uh, or EOSIO signing request at some point to be something more Antelope related. Uh, we don't want to break the protocols. That one's a little bit more tricky, um, but we're planning on kind of bundling this all under this big umbrella at some point in the future. Um, there's going to be documentation coming for core or the antelope library in the not too distant future. Um, that's one update that I guess I can kind of talk about. We have a new docs repo, which is still private, not even showing up in the recent lists. Um, oh, it's probably because I'm not logged in. So that's why we don't see it. It's private. It's just got a bunch of markdown files in it right now where we're working on examples of how to use all of the uh, primitive classes that the library provides. Um, we're kind of sort of like how we built the session kit where we were building from the ground up as well as from the top down. That's how we're starting on documentation. Um, we're starting at core, starting to document all of the very primitive functionality of Antelope. And then we're also working on session kit stuff from the top down. And those two documentation layers are going to meet somewhere in the middle. Um, the reason we're doing it this way is because it's really easy to write core documentation right now. Uh, from our side, we've been using this library now internally in Anchor and Unicove and in Anchor Link. All of our SDKs are based on core. Uh, so just writing documentation is very easy for us in that sense. Whereas with the session kit and how rapidly everything changes, uh, sometimes we hit a point in the documentation where we're like, well, that's about to change. So we shouldn't document that yet. Puts a little hurdle in the way of actually doing that. Um, as far as impacting milestones, we're really early on documentation, though we know we need some sooner than later just to get developer adoption. Um, the actual final documentation isn't going to be completed for many months, most likely, because it's going to be embedded in the website and just structured in a way that's going to make sense for new developers coming into the space who want to build web applications. So um, some updates about kind of the internals that we were doing right there. Um, on the code that is live, um, there's lots of activity happening right now across the repositories regarding localization. Um, it is, uh, it's not super intense activity, but it is um, time intensive, like just pulling strings out, putting them in the proper formats, um, and then integrating it all into the translation platform that we've now set up. So. Anchor just got a big pass on localization. It's still sitting as a pull request. Um, it needs to be reviewed. Uh, the There's a number of other plugins that have gotten that same treatment. They have less strings, but it still takes a little bit of time to coordinate them all. I think we're probably 70% done getting all the localization all set up. 
uh, not the actual translation of the content, but just getting them integrated into the systems. So that way we have the capabilities just to pop in new languages as the strings get localized. Um, lots of continuous integration type stuff happening there. Um, the web UI renderer uh, is still going through a lot of design. There were some merges that happened over the last uh, week or so. Um, you can dig through the commits if you want to check that out. Uh, master, the master branch now has uh, an updated UI. There's still some kind of annoying bugs with it, which is why we haven't published a release for it yet. Um, like, I think right now, the uh, when the modal window pops up for anything, it auto focuses on the close button. And if you press any key, it just closes the window. So we want to try to get those kind of bugs resolved in the new UI before we actually make a release of it. But that is uh, coming in quick. I'm pretty sure that there's a number of pull requests still waiting review um, to handle these sorts of issues that we're having. And then we will bundle up a release and hopefully have the next iteration of the user interface available. It's not by any means going to be the final user interface, but it will be uh, it'll be animated. It'll have a little bit more spacing and color adjustments and um, is just one step closer to the actual user interface that we want to call like a 1.0, essentially. Um, I guess alongside that, there's just been a number of bug fixes, uh, both related to the internals I was talking about and as well as things that developers have run into while they've been working on it. Um, you can kind of see those scattered across a lot of the different repositories in GitHub which I know is kind of hard to keep up on uh, because there are so many repositories. I won't go digging through and pointing them all out, but like on our weekly progress reports right now, you'll constantly see that we're just like taking in bugs and we are resolving them. Um, one thing to note about that is we did set up a project under the uh, organization that is WarfKit. Um, and now we're assigning all issues that we find into the project. So at least that way, there's some sort of board that uh, displays things across, like the web UI renderer. Uh, you can see this one's for the session kit. Um, and we're trying to create this as a place where you can actually get a better overview of everything that's going on. Not everything is, flown, is flowing through this yet, but it that's kind of the directive the team has right now is to start focusing everything through this pipeline. So that way, anybody from the community, anybody on these calls and us, we can come to this board and um, just see everything that's going on and the progress that's happening. So slowly. I noticed, uh, hmm? I noticed when uh, initializing the session kit, like the UI is um, mandatory, like you cannot not pass a UI like a new web render UI. So uh, I was wondering, how can you disable it? Like, for example, if I want to disable, like I know, for example, if you have one wallet, automatically the UI doesn't show one of the screens that usually lets you select a wallet, for example. But is mm -hmm. there a way to actually disable more screens, like this collecting stuff or, you know, launch an uh, anchor, for example? Uh, we, I think we have a GitHub issue open for that right now on the session kit itself. Um, and it's a line item to effectively disable the user interface unless it's required. Uh, that's not implemented yet. It kind of intelligently disables screens if they only have like one choice right now. Um, but yeah, the, the status messages and a number of other things currently just can't be disabled. They're, they're going to pop up and they're going to show, um, until we get that issue fixed. Uh, oh yeah, it's right here. Disabling of the status prompting. So plugins are constantly reporting statuses and updates and things to the user interface. And whenever one of those happens currently, it just shows the user interface. But also, for example, like um, we might want to have our own error handling, right? Let's say they, they do something in the UI and they try to do a transaction and it's failing. I know there's a plugin for it, but say we want to do our own kind of user experience that matches our site. So I'd like yeah. a way to kind of just be able to disable that and take off, take over the, you know, different uh, like scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I was just jotting down a note to make sure we cover that as well. Um, 
Yeah, we need to revisit error handling in general. Like right now, uh, there's a couple plugins that just throw errors in the console and they don't actually surface through Wharf, um, but then some do. So there is a bigger pass on error handling I think we need to take. And you're right, we should then allow applications to just say, hey, I want to handle it. If an error occurs, here's what you do. Um, and in that case, we probably would keep kind of the unintended behavior that's happening right now where it will just throw an error and then it would be up to you to catch that and do whatever it is you want to do with that. Exactly, because even for, uh, you know, when you do like a restore session and it's the first time where there is no, uh, like, you know, local storage matching the name uh, based on, you know, your app name and wharf dash, whatever, uh, that throws an error too. But you can easily just get around it by catching it. You know, when you do like dot then dot catch for the restore session, and that just gets rid yeah. of it. You know, because someone might want to do something else, like might prompt the user for something. I don't know. Like it's just, I always like to handle things myself. It gives us more flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Like maybe you want to update the button or try some trigger something on your own to retry it or whatever that may be. We definitely want to make sure that's possible. Perfect. Cool. Um, in terms of other, I think that's about all I have in terms of updates. Um, the what's new going on right now is there's no easy way to navigate back to the org. Um, we've started on uh, and got an initial prototype for a finality plugin, which I think is one of the closer, nope, it's down a little ways. Um, and this is going to get renamed. Uh, right now, this is a simple plugin that monitors for transaction finality. Um, the we, we apparently now have two different ideas for maintaining or checking finality. This one allows you to define a callback. And then when the transaction reaches finality, it will trigger your callback with the result of finality or it'll throw some kind of error if it doesn't reach finality. Um, and we're going to be making another one as well that um, effectively blocks user interaction until finality is reached and shows uh, that kind of finality process to the user. Um, that the, the latter one I was just talking about where it shows it, um, we do this in Anchor occasionally when we're doing really important operations. Like if we are recovering an account uh, through the owner key certificates or whether we are creating a new account, um, doing something typically that it involves like the internal state of the wallet, updating keys of in some way. Um, and in those cases, like we really need to make sure the finality is reached on that transaction because if it's not, then certain you actions get forked taken. out and yeah, place. yep. So we're working on plugins right now that, um, use the new get transaction status API endpoints, and then allow either the user to be able to follow along with finality and then ultimately do something at the end, or you as the developer to be able to follow finality and then do something in your application if, like, based on the status of the finality at the end. Um, those are new. Uh, we kind of, I think we've planned for those. I think they're in the project toolkit, but definitely uh, another good example of how these plugins can be used to kind of interact with the transaction flow itself. Um, these are these are both good examples of the after broadcast uh, hook that is available to plugins. So, if anything, they'll serve as great examples for um, how you do something after a transaction is broadcast. It'd be nice if um, it can give you updates. In the sense that you can do like, you know, using the transact plugin finality checker, you can do like transact followed by dot on, you know, for example, before dot then, uh, and then dot on confirmations or dot on, you know, whatever more another block passed, so to speak. And that way, like you can programmatically control um, if you want to do your own UI or something without yep. having to rewrite your own code, you know? Yep, absolutely. I, I think that what this currently is will be OK for that. It doesn't have the incremental events like you were talking about. That's a really cool feature. Uh, I'm going to write a note about that. Um, 
But yeah, I have it essentially be an event emitter that whenever we get a status update about the, the status of the finality, we can then pass that back to the application. You're going to probably use that same event to track the progress if you want to you know, display it or something as a percentage. Or... Yep. Maybe some graphical user element. Like when we're talking about having the other plugin available that shows the status to the user, we would definitely want like a countdown, maybe some graphical element in the um, the UI prompt itself that shows progress of some kind, whether that be a bar or something more creative. Um, but yeah, something slightly entertaining while the user is waiting because this transaction was important enough to make the user wait. Um, and then, you know, if you want to do it in your own application with like little growl style notifications that pop up somewhere when a transaction reaches finality, that's where the uh, callback method with some sort of event emitter would come in really handy. Oh, that's great. As far as other new stuff that's not bug fixes, I don't think there's a whole ton. Um, one of the kind of the last topics that Shaq's going to be familiar with is this uh, kind of experimental Ether account plugin we're coming up with right now and what that means. I figured we'd bring it up on the call just to see if anybody else had input. Um, this is based off the uh, work that the EOS Argentina team did um, with the Ether account smart contract, which lets users uh, use MetaMask to interact with that smart contract. And I know that, that there is, there's probably some overlap with all of the EVM work that's going on right now as well, because they kind of serve the same purpose in some senses, but they're also different enough. Um, so there is some development happening on that. There is a UAL plugin that exists for this Ether account. It's the UAL MetaMask plugin. Um, I didn't want to call this one MetaMask because in the future there may really be a MetaMask plugin for Wharf. Um, but this one specifically is to interact with that one uh, contract. Um, was there anything you wanted to add, Jack, before I kind of get into the challenge that we're facing? Yeah, the broad test. But like uh, for me, it's I think it's like a really good onboarding mechanism for uh, like Ethereum users. You know, like something like where you have in like a little portal, you go create account. All they have to do is send you ETH, for example, to a service, and then that automatically uses the Ether account to create them an EOS account where it's going to be associated with their uh, like it's, it's going to assign it to the EOS public key that would be derived from the MetaMask address and the signature from the first transaction. So in terms of onboarding, because like the biggest issue with onboarding is getting somebody to, to use a new tool, you know, especially coming from like, you know, uh, like everybody has Ethereum or, or has used Ethereum within the crypto space, but to get them into EOS and they're like, oh, we have to download a wallet and create an account and reach someone. Like th there have been stuff to make it easier for people, but I think this allows like a really nice, easy way to get in right away and then be able to uh, convert eventually to using Anchor using the same account. The downside of the current implementation, in my opinion, or at least the one that like US Argentina put, is that the MetaMask provider, the API endpoint that you connect to, it wrote in C++. So it's, it's and before compute transaction. So there was a lot of like, you know, issues a bit with the estimator. It's not really accurate. And uh, he wasn't doing like you guys, Aaron, in that plugin where you, you know, multiply by 1.5 to account mm -hmm. for, you know, for example, differences. So I assume people had maybe not the best experience with it because a lot of times you'd run a, you know, a transaction and they will tell you, oh, you don't have enough to cover the cost or, you know, like something along those lines after you've already, you know, signed on MetaMask, which is obviously a bad user experience. But I think that could be improved. Like obviously I wrote one in like Node.js because just much more familiar with that. And uh, like, you know, I, I really need this thing, so I'm just trying to pitch it and try to see if the rest might find it useful. And I think that kind of brings it to um, where the struggle is right now. And this may lead to other struggles with other wallet providers and potentially kind of a paradigm shift in how Orf handles transactions right now. 
Um, so posing it to the group to see if there is any thoughts or feedback on that side. Um, right now with how Wharf works is that Wharf is responsible for broadcasting of all transactions while it's are not supposed to be broadcasting transactions. Um, and that is because the like there's combinations of signatures happening potentially in Wharf. There is hooks that need to be called. Um, and the way it was actually designed is that the response from a wallet, it requires just a signature. Um, and then it can also return a modified response or a modified transaction. Like if the wallet, you know, decides to modify the transaction as it's signing it, it can accommodate for that. Um, I was, basically using the UAL plugin as a reference for this uh, and how it all works. But the way that MetaMask works currently is when you call push transaction, MetaMask handles the pushing of the transaction, which means that it doesn't return the signature. It doesn't return what transaction it pushed. It just, it returns kind of a result for you. You get a transaction ID and that breaks the paradigm that we have today in Wharf where we're Wallets are just giving us signatures at a bare minimum. So we've been checking, I've been talking about this a little bit and potentially making it so that this flow can be compatible with Wharf, you know, where the wallet could broadcast the transaction. Um, and I guess what I'm maybe looking for from the crowd or anybody watching this in the future that isn't on the call, um, is are there other wallets that we need to support that handle the broadcasting and give you no other option? Um, I can't think of any right now. Like most in the Antelope space are, we've, they've all been designed to be able to return signatures. I'm actually really surprised that MetaMask uh, pushes the transactions. There's some legal complications around who pushes the transactions. Uh, especially in the United States. So I'm surprised to hear that MetaMask is doing that. I think that um, it's also possible that apps might want to offload that to a backend, though. So maybe having a way for others to manipulate work and decide who sends it, not the wallet, you can't force a wallet to send it, um, but it might be a good plugin for the future. The problem is MetaMask only talks to the API endpoint. The MetaMask basically, you know, Ethereum style like RPC node. And to do this on EOS, you need to kind of emulate almost like an Ethereum kind of um, like server that's going to respond to all the calls MetaMask normally does. So there's like MetaMask itself that would be interacting with Wharf in this case, just does not have the information nor the ability to transact with EOS itself. So what it does is actually it talks to that API that takes the signature and then verifies it on a smart contract using a third party caller. So another account pushes that uh, transaction and charges a fee for it uh, in, you know, for example, the native currency like EOS in the example of uh, the one US Argentina did. And, and I just don't see another way where, because, you know, MetaMask is a wallet, like it, it just signs and broadcasts, like normally you specify the API endpoint. So considering EOS VM itself is gonna also allow for MetaMask use, which like I presume is gonna have to work the same way. Like I read a bit of it and saying it's using custom, you know, also uh, like um, Ethereum compatible RPC uh, node that's meant to kind of translate it into uh, EOS. So I think to be able to support those kind of wallets that have no choice but to broadcast, um, it would be nice, you know, because currently the only thing that supports it is like the old stuff, like UAL and potentially US Transit, like one would have to write a plugin, but like would support stuff like this where you can uh, just get back the TXID and have the wallet handle the broadcasting. So I think eventually it will need to be uh, added because I assume, you know, they're making a big deal about the ESVM and, if we want to have like an easier, I think, onboarding experience in general. So um, I think the big question is whether to to try, like I think for Aaron, is whether he can spend a little effort on it without breaking things uh, versus, you know, taking time on it in terms of waiting for, your, you know, EVM and making maybe a more holistic uh, approach. 
So I think that there's two different concepts here, right? So there's the EVM stuff, uh, which is very separated from uh, using MetaMask on EOS native. Uh, so the EVM, all you really need to do is you need to add the network to MetaMask and you're good to go. It's, uh, it's not quite the same because it's, it's, it's full support for, for Ethereum, right? Um, for the EOS but native I mean, support... If a site wants, but, but this is happening on EOS, right? So if a site wants to integrate the login with MetaMask to use EVM, they will they cannot use wharf they'll have to do the like you know yes, just write correct. the code for it and that's what correct. we're talking about is like to try to have wharf add support for that where it's limited support meaning it for example just relays the txid back to wharf uh, and allow the wallet basically to broadcast it and return you know if it can't return the well, signature we're talking about an eventuality not something not something that uh, is meant to be worked on immediately right yes and there's a, I mean, when we're talking about being able to use Wharf for Ethereum style transactions like that, there's a lot more work involved in that because everything in Wharf is expecting a envelope based transaction right now. Right. Um, I mean, there's yeah. also the, there's like the, I don't know, I guess philosophical uh, part of this, which is that Ant or uh, Wharf is first and foremost meant to be uh, an SDK for antelope. So the question here becomes, what is the impact on its its support for Antelope if we're taking other chains into account? Ethereum as just one example. But it's right. not another chain, right? This is all happening on, you're not like interacting with Ethereum. You're interacting with only EOS. Well, for EVM, chain. you are interacting technically with, it's not, yes, it's not Ethereum itself, but it is an EVM. It's a fully compatible EVM. There are SDKs out there, which Worf would have a hard time rivaling, right? There's Ethers, yeah. there's WebTurk. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess for the use case I'm talking about, it's not necessarily use EVM. It's more just like login with MetaMask using the, that Ether account. And I think right, it so, could be done without too much uh, like disturbance to to the existing structure. So, so yeah, that's the real question I'm asking: is if we wanted to support, uh, or if Worf were to support the EOS native interactions, then would the impact be large? And if not, then that's great. Uh, but if it would change drastically the structures here required for Antelope integration, it seems like something we might want to kick down, uh, kick the can down the road. Yeah, I think That's... it won't necessarily uh, like change the structure, but may expand the structure with like another, you know, field or so. Yeah, I think that's that's been my biggest concern is just, I think, and like flipping this on its head and thinking about from the developer point of view, um, like let's imagine a web app that uses uh, Antelope an antelope chain, it's going to probably use Wharf or, you know, still use UAL or something like that. Um, but if somebody's building a web app that uses an EVM on an antelope chain, it most likely will be using uh, Ethereum native tooling. And is there a situation where both of those make sense to be in the same place? I, I don't know if I have an answer for that at this point. It seems like it would be fairly complicated to build a, a web app that supports multiple chain architectures, um, simply because like in your application, like if you wanna do a token transfer, if you're working in the EVM, it's gonna be one format of token transfer. And if you're working in Antelope, it's gonna be another, like those transactions are gonna be completely different. And it would be upon the developer at that point to say, okay, right now I'm building an Ethereum transaction, it's gonna go through the Ethereum style SDKs, or I'm building a antelope based transaction, and it's gonna go through all the antelope based SDKs. Like, uh, from my perspective, I'm looking at it from like Unicove, which is just a web wallet. And does anybody ever log into that, to interact with the EVM? I, I don't think so, uh, though it could be a, cool feature, but it would almost be like two separate apps at that point. Ultimately, it's also going to come down to like uh, what the documentation for the EOS EVM suggests users to do. Right now, that is, of course, uh, Ethereum tooling because that's what exists. And by the time that WARF exists, that means that we're flipping 
uh, we're flipping third party developers over to something else and possibly deprecating support for, uh, well, I mean, just side by side support. So we also have to consider what that means for them in the future. Also, this is the EOS EVM, <laughs> right. which is a little strange for Wharf, which is an Antelope tool. Yeah, in the case of the like Ether account, you're using Wharf using normal, like you're writing actions that are, you know, right. just normal Antelope actions, and you're just like uh, relying on the plugin to do the conversion uh, or like to do what is needed, basically. And then you just take the response back from uh, MetaMask. So, you know, it's kind of handled mostly externally to Wharf itself. The big issue here is to allow or not to allow wallets to broadcast themselves. I think that's the main yeah. uh, point here. Because at the end of the day, I would like to use, you know, like uh, obviously Wharf, I've converted my stuff to Wharf, but now I might have to go back to UAL, which is obviously like not something I want to do. And uh, I'm wondering even if one could write a patch and just like, I can run it, you know, versus like, um, like necessarily have it as part of the um, like main NPM, for example. Yeah, and I think I, I guess what I'm trying to find is, is if there are other situations with wallets that need the same compatibility to add support uh, to like support the idea that wallets should be able to broadcast transactions. Um, I know when, as we've done development on Anchor over the years, we've allowed that. Like you can specify flags to say, hey, Anchor, you should be in charge of broadcasting this. And all we're going to expect back is um, like confirmation that it was broadcast, as well as all the other, like it's the same payload that you receive back. Um, it'll still have signatures and IDs and transaction results. Um, but are there other wallets? that are gonna exist in the ecosystem or that should be able to have this broadcasting thing, or is it just MetaMask at this point as the only thing? And that's not to say that it's not worth doing. I'm just trying to add uh, more reason behind trying to explore this change. I guess it could be, but it's, like, it's not like currently the situation, right? We don't necessarily know what people are gonna build. But there yeah. could be wallets that want to, you know, retry transactions and have their own, you know, whitelist and retry mechanisms and, and track all the history of every transaction that went through the wallet. Because if, if the wallet is just giving back the signature, it doesn't actually know if that got submitted or not. And then we'll have to implement some type of history solution. So I see something like that, but obviously it's not like there's, you know, a thousand people building wallets. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not like necessarily a priority thing. I think it's really more like, what effort is gonna take? Because like I'm willing, obviously, to put in the effort. I I just don't want to go back to UAL. And part of this thing is a replacement for UAL. So it's a replacement for EOSJS as well as UAL. So I think having that, like, you know, was broadcasted, like UAL had or something, like it could be done cleanly. I think without much effort to uh, to just have it, like we discussed a bit, Aaron, like just another, you know, like field. That gets passed that says you know was broadcasted or broadcasted txid and that auto disables you know the hooks for example yeah yeah and i mean there's a lot of parts where it's i mean it currently in the spec it, it's requiring at least one signature to come back from a wallet so everything that then interacts with that signature after the fact needs to be modified and there's just these ripples um that like i said in our direct message conversation um, that are unknown at this point. Um, and I guess kind of the way I'm looking at this big picture is we kind of have um, uh, a chance at this point to maybe define how we expect wallets that are integrating to behave and whether or not we want to, to encourage wallets to take that on um, for this reason. And I mean, we can still encourage even if the feature exists that wallets do not broadcast. But right now we're like requiring them to and maybe that's a benefit. I don't I don't have a well formed opinion, I guess, at this point. Um, but it's certainly it's kind flexible. of flexible. You know what I mean? Like it, it, yeah. it limits certain options like this. It does. Like 
but allowing the wallet option. to do the broadcasting then limits what Worf can do and all of the plugins within Worf. Like, yeah, but I, that will only apply to that wallet, right? Like, it's not going to take away from Worf's features for the average, you know, that user or developer. But for somebody yeah. who wants to go do this kind of advanced, you know, more or less uh, uh, setup, you know, like this, you know, the limitations of the plugin, so to speak. Well, and, uh, it it might though. It might impact plugin developers and like co-signers, for example. Like with uh, MetaMask, there's no way to pass in an existing signature. I don't believe. So if there was any multi any transactions with multiple signatures that flow through this process, like they immediately wouldn't work with this new design allowing wallets to broadcast um, unless yeah, they the were capable is, of accepting signatures. Yeah, but the whole thing is, 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 you know, like this is not meant as a, MetaMask is not meant as a replacement necessarily for an advanced wallet like Anchor. It's meant more as a onboarding uh, tool for the like Ethereum crowd. So they're not necessarily, you know, like co-signing or doing any like me and my code i'll have to obviously change some things where you know like we don't co-sign certain things if i'm using metamask and uh, this is like you know like this is the average user who's going to do that is somebody who's not familiar with usio at all and once they get familiar then they can migrate to anchor just importing the private key and you know they can do all that advanced stuff but for that average user it's uh, you know like the people who are going to use this plugin are going to use it for mainly that like you, you can log in you can create an account and you can transact basic transactions or any transactions as long as it's not you know co-signing or uh things of the sort i'm going to keep pushing back until you know you say no <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's kind of what i'm figuring out i'm just feeling out different aspects of this uh before we make the change and trying to get additional input um i'm like I said in the direct messages, I'm definitely planning on doing research on like what the implications of this would be from a code perspective. Um, and I don't know what those are yet, but I figure bringing this up early, getting those here to put any thought towards it is beneficial. Um, and then whoever watches this over the coming week or two or whatever it may be, um to understand this situation this kind of like fork in which direction this could go um because yeah i mean i definitely see the benefit and then i don't have good visibility into this but and i also don't have good visibility into the evm and both are kind of due to a lack of time mostly but does evm just completely replace this in the future is kind of something that i don't know um it, I don't think so, because it's very different model. Like I'm not familiar really with US EVM. I didn't look into it much, but my understanding it's is very separate. Because to interact with US EVM, you need to kind of I think bridge your tokens over to that EVM and yeah, uh, and kind of interact with the EVM through like a translator API. You're not you're not really interacting with uh, USIO uh, like a contract, which you do in like my scenario, you know. But I could be wrong. Like uh, like you, I haven't spent much yeah. time on US EVM, but I kind of know the other one inside out. It's certainly interesting. And I, even, I guess, from my perspective, it's I'm still confused at some parts of this, just because this is a way to use MetaMask on the antelope side through kind of a translation layer. And then there's using MetaMask on the EVM side, which is not a translation layer. Well, it is, but it's, you know, you play in that sandbox then. you Both of these are different applications of MetaMask to work on either side of this fence. Um, and is that gonna be a weird experience? I don't, I don't quite know, but. But yeah, my point is that like, it's up to the, like I would vouch for that, or like I would vote for the developer to make that choice how they want to do their user experience you know if it ends up like confusing people i think that's kind of the developer's issue um because you know you can make like really good ux that's like guys that use it through anything they need and uh, like in my experience with this metamask like it's you know if i want to make say like an account for someone else and i'm already like say i i made an account through ether account by just sending you know eos to it then i can just literally send eos to a brand new 
MetaMask address, say a buddy of mine that wants to get into EOS, I can literally just send like say to, you know whatever a few EOS uh, to Ether to, to basically just through MetaMask to his address using the in uh, built-in transfer, you know, of MetaMask. And then automatically that will create a user for that his friend or whatever, where it's attached to his own uh, private key uh, that's associated with his address. So it's just so easy. Like, a, like I don't think you get that like easy onboarding, especially to each people with anything else. Yeah, into the native side at least. I mean, the same is true of pulling somebody into the EVM side, but on the native side, this is, I mean, it could be just as easy with uh, a native account creator, but then you got to put public keys and exchange them and whatever. This is, this is sending to a public key, essentially, an Ethereum well, formatted yeah, public creating, key. It's creating first, like on the first transfer, it creates like an account, a random account name. You can actually pass like a desired account name, but it generally creates like a, a random account name through the contract and assigns the contract's active keys with the permissions of that new account created. But then after you do your first transaction through MetaMask, obviously connected to Antelope, uh, then the signature used in addition to the address is going to be used to derive the actual compatible EOS public key that will uh, that will allow you to basically use your MetaMask private key, just convert it to WIF and import it into Anchor and continue. And then you can change, like on the first, sorry, on the first transaction after you decode uh, the EOS public key, then the contract auto assigns that public key to the user in a one out of two. So then the contract can still do it on behalf of the user, but then the user can also uh, import it and then, you know, even remove, you know, like Ether accounts from the permissions once he transfers over to, you know, uh, Anchor, for example. So it's like the easiest, you know, like for, for the average user, I think, average Ethereum user, obviously. Yeah. And I, I... I haven't asked this yet, but um, I know a lot of the client side stuff is open source. Is the contract as well as the API implementation open source? The, pl the, the plugin is obviously over open source. The contract is open source, though the, um, the actual MetaMask provider, the API endpoint or RPC endpoint that you're going to add to MetaMask to add it, you know, the, the chain to MetaMask. That one, um, I don't think US Argentina like open sourced it, but uh, he doesn't mind, you know, necessarily to do that from my understanding. It's just because he, he's like a C++ guy and, you know, the average person is not gonna use C++ to right. write like, you know, like uh, an RPC server, for example. Uh, so for example, for me, I had his code, he gave it to me, but like, I, you know, like uh, I just wrote my own version in uh, Node.js. Cool. Cool, cool. But it's yeah, not it, hard, like it's quite simple, you know, like yeah. you're just handling like 10 calls or with different methods. Doing some conversion and whatnot. Yeah, it makes sense. And then charging. Well, basically, you're not even converting, you're like taking that RLP because basically what it does is like encodes all the action parameters into like the RLP kind of format. And then you're sending that RLP directly to the smart contract. As it is, you're just like, you know, removing the you know, the starting zero X, for example, from it, you're sending it to the smart contract along with the fee you're charging and any RAM that the user may need to buy before executing this action. It's like well thought out, you know? And then whoever is running that provider can, you know, uh, can make that call on behalf, you know, on a user and whatever user calls that action to the Ether account contract gets paid the fee that got charged. So kind of like that's how it works. So there could be multiple yeah. providers and multiple callers. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some shift in paradigm there. I'm trying to think. It it's also a little odd that, you know, we're not going to be able to surface API endpoints through Wharf to be able to do this work because of the API endpoints defined in MetaMask, which is kind of another paradigm shift between how these two ecosystems differ. Um, I guess I don't have to think about this out loud. This will all be stuff that I kind of investigate probably over the weekend.
but yeah, you're not necessarily defining, like you said, the API. You could override it, I guess, but like you're you, you're using the one that's in their MetaMask. You know? Yeah, yeah, you're just passing the transaction to MetaMask, and then MetaMask handles everything else from there on out. And MetaMask is only going to return a result, right? So, yeah, unfortunately, it'd be really nice if they allowed you to return signature. Yeah, I wonder if you can actually do like um, like a get transaction receipt or something that it automatically does, and um, the provider then fetches that transaction and, and provides it to the user or, or to, um, no, because even then it's just going to provide it to MetaMask and MetaMask is not going to respond to Warf. That's the whole yeah. issue is MetaMask is only sending the result on signing and there's not more to it, you know? Yep. I'm okay yeah. also if it was done as like a patch or like, you know, a fork. So that way you don't really need to worry too much about the, um, you know, the after effects or the ripple effects as much because now it's not, you know, what people are using necessarily. And the people who are going to use that fork or patch or whatever can, can do their own testing and see if it suffices for them uh, in their use case or not, you know? Yeah. So kind of like just another branch or another, you know. Yeah, and I thought. Yeah, I think we'll probably know best once we kind of understand what kind of ripples it'll cause through the transaction flow in the session kit. Um, and yeah, right now I don't honestly know. So I guess to be determined on that front. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And if you guys or anybody else uh, runs into a like a wallet itself that behaves more like MetaMask where it needs to do the broadcasting and there's no way around it. Um, that's something really good to know up front because that would really help shape this this design for this flow. Um, right now it is literally just this one potential use case of MetaMask within the Antelope side of things that uh, is impacted by this, so. Yeah, I wonder, I think they all like return signatures or could. Um, I haven't played a lot with the mobile wallets. I'm not sure how they behave, but uh, my guess is they also allow you not to broadcast. Yeah, as far this as I know. It's pretty indicative of uh, the old design of EOSJS, the original design of EOSJS. Well, just the design of EOSJS that has signature providers. Um, and it expected you to return a signature instead of returning a transaction ID. So it's kind of yeah. forced upon developers. Yeah, so it's entirely possible that most, if not all, wallets currently follow that paradigm just because of that early uh, design decision. Also super interesting to hear that there's some like legal discussion around that now. I hadn't heard that before. I actually don't know if that's been resolved. It was something that we investigated early on hmm. and uh, found that we shouldn't be sending transactions from internally from the wallet. Yeah, let the app broadcast them. <laughs> well, yeah, well, so that it's particularly about uh, gambling applications and stuff like that, which is jur jurisdiction specific. Um, and for things like transfer and all of that stuff, it, there's no there's no problem with it. But it's the unknown of having others send transactions through your application, which was worrisome. Yeah. It's a little but bit they more. They still need to sign it, right? Like, so it's not like you're relaying something that is like, you know, you had a you you have a way of doing it. You still need their signature. Yeah, anyway, and it's, it's not there's it wasn't clear like legislation either. Like, who is the person that's sending it? Is it the app, the wallet developer, or is it the person who is using the wallet because it's a local wallet? No. It's actually the API, I guess. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you that's true. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're screwed, Aaron. Yeah, out. we don't get to control who pushes transactions through it. <laughs> oh, but you should. Um, yeah, this is an interesting thought experiment and uh, is definitely kind of challenging some of the assumptions we made early on. So I think that's probably why I'm most keen on exploring this. Um, yeah, good, good conversation around that. Um, I know we are coming up against our hour deadline, so maybe take this last five minutes or so, and if there were any other topics we wanted to bring up on the call, open the floor to those. 
Well, first I want to say like now that I actually converted like our main things to uh, Worf, it's like amazing. Uh, I did realize that in restore session, it's actually restoring from the session variable versus the sessions, you know, like uh, in your local storage. And mm -hmm. the way I got around that was to use the uh, uh, dot get sessions and then loop through those and do a restore on each. And that way I'm able to, you know, refresh and I'm logged into, say, the four chains uh, in my application, which is quite nice. Oh. So you actually want multiple sessions to be restored at once. Because yeah, right now the default behavior is just to restore the last session that was used. Exactly. But like I achieved that behavior too, because you have a call for um, uh, dot get sessions for like mm -hmm. session kit dot get sessions, uh, then grabs the local storage defined in sessions. Because you store both, you store the last session and all the sessions. So uh, in, in local storage, but when you do restore, it's only you need to pass it a session, and by default, it, if you don't specify, you know, a manual one, it will, you know, use that like wharf dash whatever dap name dash session. So, uh, but if you use that like get sessions, you get an array of all the different session objects for all the logged in, um, you know, like uh, any logged in chain that wasn't logged out. And then you can just iterate over that and do restore session. But this time you're passing on the session object, like right. kind of manually uh, in a way. And that was perfect, you know? All right. Um, yeah, the way it was designed was you'd call get sessions, and that's what you'd use for a list for an account switcher as opposed to using them directly. And then when you found one you actually wanted to use, you'd call restore with that session as a parameter. But maybe what we could do is just make it so that when you call get sessions, every single one of them is a restored session that you could then use. But that's already the case. So uh, because you're storing the same thing. So right, like in session itself, you're only keeping the last session, you know, the four parameters or whatever. Right. Uh, whatever it is. But in sessions, you know, whatever, wharf dash dab dash sessions, local storage, that one keeps all of them. Correct. It's, each one, each row contains a session object. So really, all you have to do is re, like iterate over the result of get sessions, and uh, and then just call uh, restore session, and you pass on you know uh, each row, which is just right. like, uh, the session object. And I have it working great, like for our bridge stuff and all that stuff. Like as soon as I refresh, I'm literally logged into everything, and all my handlers, like you know automatically take over and you know I have balances of everything for all the different accounts on all chains because I need consecutive log like um, not consecutive but like uh, concurrent logins to all yeah. the chains. Yeah and the design was very much that you were logged into one account at a time and you could switch between them but it sounds like you actually want to be logged in as all of them at once. Yeah and I achieved multiples. that like I didn't have any hurdle. Oh. Yeah, I want to be logged into four at once. And yeah. that's what I do. And I keep them in different, like each kind of session created, I keep it in a different kind of like inside like a global store under the name of the chain. Mm -hmm. So depending what the user is doing, I call the right session. You know, I name it like, for example, ux.wallet, you know, dot transact or, you know, whatever like, yeah. uh, convention one uses internally. But no, it works amazing for that. Like, that's it's so fast. That's awesome to hear. Um... There probably are some inefficiencies happening right there, but probably nothing noticeable um, just because it's meant like the whole thing was really designed around you having one active session object and then the JSON representations of all the others that you could restore. Um, so like as you're looping through the sessions and restoring them with the restore command, like there's some other internal stuff that's happening. None of it's super heavy, but it is switching that singular session each time you exactly. do that. But that's um, only in the local storage. So you'll update the, you know, the session in the local storage to the last login yeah. you did. But that doesn't affect you as long as you're using, you know, the session, for example, that you got back when you restored. As long as you have a way where, you know, like when you connect the wallet or when it's restored, you you have these stored separately or at least can access them separately. And then, yeah. like, I'm able to do everything. Like, uh, I'm always logged into everything. You know, I'm bridging. I'm submitting proofs using another account. Everything is always logged in and like works great, you know? That's that's awesome that it works. I mean, I can't say it was intended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe we can make some improvements there as well to just make it so that you can 
you don't have to iterate yourself that when you just call get sessions, they're already there ready to use. Um, because yeah, I can imagine in an IBC world, uh, there's going to be applications that want to have multiple sessions active at the same time. So I just wrote a note down for that. And maybe we'll give that a look too to see if we can make it even easier and more intuitive as where you don't have to do the looping and the restoring yeah. and that kind of stuff. But it made sense to me the way it's currently done because get sessions, you're only getting the session. You're not restoring the session, mm -hmm. right? So it's more like the restore session. You're saying maybe if you want to change that to automatically restore all sessions. Um, but uh, like I like the way it's, it is currently. You know, it gives you the flexibility where most users just want to restore session, one account, and we want to restore multiples. Yeah. They just, you know, get the sessions and reiterate over them. Yeah. Well, maybe it's like we milliseconds, you know. Yeah, exactly. And maybe we can keep it the way it is. So that way that will continue yeah. to function that way. But maybe there's an additional function called restore all or something that if you call For restore example. all, it would do what you're doing just to kind of remove the need to do that in every application that wants it. Yeah, that'd be so, great too. Cool. Not as high priority as getting the was broadcasted, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, was there anything else you guys wanted to cover on today's call? I think that's good. I guess to test the latest version, I can just, you know, do npm install and put in like the GitHub link, the GitHub URL. And I that think that work works. In theory. Um, the way we do it internally is we clone down the repo itself and we build locally and then we use the link command that is within Yarn. Um, and I think it's within okay. npm and pmpm and all those other ones. Um, and then you can just link your local build from the like session kit or from the web UI renderer into your but project. That gets, but that gets a bit annoying, especially when you start deploying to different machines. Like if you do it just through NPM, even you do like NPM install the, you know, GitHub URL yeah. dash dash yeah. save in your package JSON, it's going to have that URL. And then when you do NPM install on another server, it will handle that automatically for you, yep. you know? Yep, if you want to do it across multiple machines, absolutely. Uh, I guess what I was talking about is mostly for development purposes. But for deployment, oh, yeah, yeah, you could use the GitHub URL. OK, perfect. Maybe I'll play around with the new UI stuff. Yeah. Before yeah. it gets released. <laughs> you're yeah. welcome to and welcome to provide feedback if you run into bugs and whatever else. Perfect. Cool. All right. Well. Uh, I guess for next week, I'm planning on still holding this meeting. And then the following week, maybe two after that, this meeting probably will not be occurring. Um, I'm going to be doing a little bit more traveling and uh, just won't be at a place where I can like broadcast and share and do things like this. So uh, I'll update the calendar invites for those. And we'll continue communication through Telegram over that time and go from there. So. And maybe reach out to ENFC if they plan to actually or require in the future uh, or want, basically not require, but want uh, WARF to support, you know, things to do with EVM and then, you know, work out a new, uh, you know, additional kind of like proposal might be cool. Yeah, it's, I don't know what that future looks like, but having some sort of underlying thread of what that looks like maybe later this year or into next year or something like at least considering it as we move forward would be good. Yeah, because I think the beta is coming out on mainnet uh, after tomorrow. So it'll yeah. be interesting. Yep, yep, yep. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Eric. All right. Well, thanks, guys.